Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I'm here at the Dallas Open uh, in the cool setup uh, with a food court area and there's some practice courts over here uh, and I'm with Mark Lucero, the coach of Steve Johnson. Well, Mark, welcome. Up? Ah, thanks man, good to be here. We finally made it happen. I know, we've been talking about this <laughs> for uh, what, like six months now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to three of the same tournaments. We were in my home state, the way to do yeah, it in your home state. Indian Wells. <laughs> yeah. Uh, world Team Tennis and so on. So um, how's the week been so far? We were just talking a little bit about you feel like this has been a good setup here. Yeah, it's been awesome. Um, I flew out here Saturday morning. Stevie flew out here Friday. Uh -huh. And yeah, it's been great. You know, the, there were great crowds yesterday, the first day of qualities, uh, which was Sunday. And practice has been easy. Like Grant Chen here is a good friend of ours from California. And he's the, you know, the head men's coach. And he really sort of greased the wheels for everything for us to make it really easy. And um, yeah, just super happy. And it's just great to see fan engagement because the last tournament, you know, with this version was in Long Island. They kind of struggled. So it's yeah. been awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, you're here with Steve Johnson. Uh, he's got his singles match. You just found out not tomorrow, but it's going to be on Wednesday. Um, how is uh, Steve's level right now? How are you all feeling about uh, everything going into this tournament? Yeah, I feel pretty good. It was a good start to the year. It was a good January I, from, I think, both of our point of views. You know, he got a bunch of matches in. Normally, he's been a slow starter in his past seasons. If you look at his results in Australia, they haven't, you know, in, historically been great. So this year, I felt pretty good about it. Um, you know, it was weird because it was a condensed off-season. You know, World Team Tennis ran late into November. Yeah. And then, you know, December, you have family. We both had different family obligations. So we really only practiced together maybe three or four days in December. And all of December yeah. before we went to Australia, which is kind of funny. But yeah. um, he felt ready to go. And, you know, we both kind of felt refreshed. And, yeah, January was good. He had a little injury coming out of Melbourne. Uh -huh. He coming out of Adelaide 2, carrying into Melbourne. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's all good now. And uh, I thought even in spite of that, he played well in Melbourne, like good win over Jordan Thompson and then yeah. uh, a tough one with Sinner. Yeah, and, yeah. But it's a tough draw. Yeah, but you know, we went into February feeling pretty optimistic, so. Yeah, yeah, I think I watched the Thompson match. He won in five. Won in five, yeah. Yeah, that was a really, pretty good effort. Yeah, that was a really tough one. Um, that was a fun match to watch, too. Uh, so why did he not uh, play any doubles there? Or maybe he played one tournament? Well, it, it, yeah, it was because um, because of the groin issue coming uh, out of Adelaide 2. I see. He, okay. he, he, told, he was supposed to play Austin Krychik in Melbourne. Right. And yeah. they had the conversation before the tournament. Yeah. Um, you know, Steve wanted to make sure that Austin had the best chance to do well. And also for Steve, for his own self, if he was able to get through a round of singles, which we weren't even sure if he would be able to, yeah. we didn't want to be in the position where, you know, he had to go play doubles, yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. nursing an injury, potentially making it worse. That we just makes, didn't want to makes total do that. Sense. Yeah. So was that public knowledge at the time, or is that that he was hurt? Yeah. Do you all like try to keep that kind of? Uh, I think if you saw him playing Adelaide, you would have. <laughs> you <laughs> <would've known. laughs> yeah, okay. you would have known. And okay. I think people are aware. The locker room's aware. Yeah. Um, you know, it's different from the NFL. Like, we don't, tennis doesn't publish, like, an injury list yeah, uh, yeah, every right. Thursday or whatever. In injury report. <laughs> Which I think they should. Maybe they should. Maybe. I don't yeah. know. For the fans. I don't know. And for the gamblers, right? Like, they're the ones who. For the gamblers. Yeah. yeah. But, they, uh, yeah, a website like that would make a lot of money on the gamblers. Yeah. They'd pay for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I do remember uh, at World Team Tennis, I was talking to uh, Phil, who's over here now, yep. um, and he was he's the coach of Austin Krychek, and I'm hoping to have him on the podcast at some point this week, but yeah, he told me that they were going to play together again this year, um, and uh, hopefully maybe later uh, in the year. Yeah, I think... Uh Sorry, you're going to find spots in the calendar to where doubles make sense, and Steve likes to play doubles. Uh, yeah. But, you know, his priority is singles and trying to put himself in the best position to do well. But he loves playing with Austin. Like, they had good results. They yeah, finaled they Cincinnati. And, right. Um, yeah, they're, they're a really good team, and they, they played well in the first Adelaide, I yeah. believe. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, hopefully the fans can still hear us because uh, the last started, but um, I'll hold the mic a little closer. Um, so, uh, with him and Austin playing together, it's a lefty-righty combo. I asked Phil this question in um, in uh, Indian Wells and wanted to get your perspective on it. So they, um, they actually play with uh, backhands in the middle and forehands on the outside. Uh, what's the reason for that, from your perspective? Um... Are you involved in a lot of the doubles coaching? Or no, to be honest, if you, if you would have asked me what side they play, like yeah. right now, cold, I would have. I would have been a total okay. guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
to be honest, like, let Phil kind of handle that. You know, yeah, and, Steve, and I think he just kind of gives out the plays anyway. So. Yeah, you know, he, he's pretty versatile, returning from both sides. Right. Um, and it's, I, I think when Steve plays, it's more a matter of, you know, finding where his partner's comfortable. And, and mm-hmm. usually with some of the doubles only guys, like, like Austin, yeah. they play much more on one side than the other. So Steve can kind of be the uh, like the utility infielder in baseball. Like you know, if you have a hole, you plug him in there, and you let the guys who kind of have their set positions play there. Yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I, I have another question for you about Steve. Uh, I'm gonna kind of challenge you a little bit on this. So when I watch him play, I feel like he. Every second serve, he hits a kick serve to the backhand. Every second serve. Why does he ever mix it up and hit a slice serve, especially in the new sport? Yeah, you know, it's been kind of a little bit of a talking point about trying to mix things up and okay. um, not, be, I mean, not be so predictable. Than me, but but the, the goal is to not, not be predictable. Right, exactly. Um, I feel like it, it can be a good strategy to start out, but then you can play somebody into a rhythm, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, know, I'll tell him that Will said to mix in some slice <laughs> serves. I mean, I don't uh, know if he he'd be, should be taking advice from me, but I'm just curious. Like, yeah, you know, if you look at his numbers, actually, they support what you're saying. Like, the, his win percentage when he serves second serves to the forehand is actually quite high. That's what I would think, because he he'll get a forehand for the serve plus one. And usually, and most players needs. too are looking, they're leaning one way, they're leaning to the backhand. So right. the challenge for him is to, is to be aware when he's going heavy, heavy one side yeah, to mix the up the body serve, use the forehand serve, and then it'll make that kick serve to the back end much more effective. Better, yeah. yeah, if they have to honor both sides, right, 100%. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a, a few, probably a month ago, I listened to your uh, interview with Kamal Murray, um, which was a great interview. We'll link to it. Uh, <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> link to it in the show notes. Uh, and I, I don't remember all the details, but I remember you were, you were telling your story of how you got started in tennis. You went to uh, law school, mm-hmm. um, and it was, it was a really good story. So tell the listeners Thanks. a little bit about like kind of your story of how you got started in tennis to where you are now. Yeah, um, I you know I grew up as a kid playing all the sports, and there was just one summer when I remember watching this like skinny kid with long hair and jean shorts like play on TV a bunch of times, and yeah. you know I started seeing him on television a lot and I said you know hey mom like I think I want to do tennis lessons and at the same time a bunch of my buddies from high school or from high school from grade school they wanted to say they for whatever reason talked to their parents and my mom's like oh it's funny because you know your friends so and so and so and so they all want to take lessons too so there was a group of five of us myself my brother a set of twins and then another dude so there were five of us we took a group lesson once a week Mm -hmm. from a local pro at some like swim and tennis club and uh you know, it, it was chaos, but I loved it. And yeah. I ended up just, you know, falling in love with the game and sticking with it. Um, a lot fast forward, I played tennis at Boston College, and mm-hmm. uh, I thought I was going to go straight into, like, some sort of grad school after. Yeah. Um, I had this, like, crisis of conscience one night, like, in my senior year, and I realized that I wasn't ready to do that. I, I still had more tennis in me. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to go play some tournaments, you know, travel, play some futures, whatever. And, you know, I called my mom the next morning. I was like, Mom, like, I had a terrible night last night. I couldn't sleep. Like, you know, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And she's like, that's so funny because your dad couldn't sleep last night either. Oh. And she's like, you know, he was thinking about what you're going to do next year. And, yeah. you know, he wants to support you to do, you know, what you want to do. Wow. And so I talked to my dad that day. And, you know, we had this heart to heart. And, you know, we came to this agreement where, you know, he would support me, like, to play, like, another year of tennis, like, and yeah. travel and do whatever if I went to law school after. Oh, so, okay. you know, like, I'm like, oh, that sounds like a great deal. You know, I can bluff my way through law school even if I have no interest in it. Yeah. Uh, and I, ended, you know, played my year, like, didn't do anything worth noting. And I found myself in law school and at the University of San Diego. And at the same time, I was still, I was working with some kids on the weekend. I was playing money tournaments, like, on the weekends as well yeah. um, while in school. And, you know, I liked school-ish, but I wasn't, like, I wasn't all in. You know, yeah. I, just, I just wasn't all in. Wasn't all there because I still had one foot in this other world. Yeah. And at the end of that year, I took a job coaching a girl in Orange County who, um, you know, who I had known. And I was like, gosh, I really, really like this. I think I want to – actually, that's, that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, I took a job. I took some kids to some tournaments in Europe. Okay. Just as, as a summer job. Yeah. And my dad had said, you know, yeah, okay, you can stop going to law school if you have a plan when you come back from Europe. Yeah. Didn't, I didn't have a plan. Yeah. Um, I stopped in Boston for a couple of days to see one of my buddies. And 
I was like, what's the easiest thing for me to do? It's coach. So I was looking through coaching jobs, like college coaching jobs. I applied for a job at Princeton, women's assistant, because I thought that it would buy me a couple weeks. Just to tell my dad I had some yeah. irons in the fire. Yeah. Uh, we ended up speaking with a coach who, she was maybe 25, 26. It was going to be her first head coaching job. And we saw kind of eye to eye. You know, I kind of strung the process along because I wanted to yeah. just keep buying time. Keep your and, options and, open. You know, after a week or so, she was like, listen, I need to know, like, are you a real candidate? Or, like, you know, should I move on? And I was working out one day with my former trainer, and he's like, what's the worst thing that could happen? You take the job and you don't like it and you come back, you know? And yeah. so I'm like, okay, like, you know, let's do it. So that was my first job. I got into college tennis that way. I went to Princeton. I coached there for three years. I uh, left Princeton, took a job coaching this girl who we had recruited at Princeton in Orange County, and I found that I really liked the individual coaching, not yeah. having a time constraint, not having a bunch of players to worry about, but coaching right. one-on-one. That led me to another job, um, you know, coaching a player who was like around 500 in the world. Uh, we improved the ranking quite a bit in a short amount of time. A few months later, I was signing up for Facebook one day because I was bored with her at a tournament and freaking... Venezuela or Toronto or somewhere I got a message back from this guy that I had friended on Facebook yeah. and he worked for the USTA he's like Mark I've been trying to contact you I've been trying to figure out a way to get in touch we're adding some positions in Carson would you be interested yeah. that led to five years with the USTA and one thing led to another and here I am <laughs> so how long have you been working with uh, Steve uh, we started in December of 2019 okay so we yeah, started then, got into the pandemic, and here we are, yeah. Here's Phil. How you doing? Uh, sorry, man. I'm, you're good. I need to get my mail. I'll send you a Whatever. Text. You're, you're good. Hey, you're good. No, no, no you're fine. <laughs> hey, I'll reach out to you. I just got your mail. No rush. You here all week? I'm here all week. Yeah, no rush, man. Um, where were we? So, so December 2019. Okay. Um, got we it. Started, is that right? We started working together, yeah. Okay. And who were you coaching before that? Shelby Rogers. Shelby Rogers. We worked yeah. together for quite a while. Um, yeah. She's had a great last couple of years. For all of 2015, all of 2016, 2017, yeah. 2018, and 2019, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and have you coached any doubles at all? I guess in college you have to a little bit. But... In college, um, you know, obviously, like, when Shelby or the other players I worked with, when they would play doubles, like, yeah. we try to do some stuff. Um, but I find myself seeking out people that I think are really good at doubles. Okay. Well, well, for working singles, yeah. But yeah. in terms of when it comes to learning about doubles or trying to help my players with doubles, yeah. I ask people that I think are really good. Like, okay. so... You know, Eric Buderak is someone who, like, I've leaned on in the past, right. like, and, you know, <laughs> in spite of what it might seem like, my ego is very small, so I always try to seek out people that can help my players. Yeah, so I've brought Eric Buderak into practices with Shelby a bunch of times, you know, Bethany Maddox-Sands, like, yeah. you know, if she's on court with Shelby, like, at Fed Cup, we were always, you know, all ears, or yeah. um, Lisa Raymond was Fed Cup doubles, you know, sure. we'd ask Lisa... So I try to learn about doubles from those kind of people. Yeah, me, yeah. me as well. We've had Eric on the show, and I, I definitely want to have uh, Lisa. And New Eric tournament director well. for Cincinnati. I know, I saw that. Shout out, Eric. Congratulations, yeah. buddy. Yeah, yeah that's going to be really awesome. He'll do a good job there. Um, uh, so for singles, what, what do your practices look like right now with Steve? Um, let's say two types of practices. One is uh, off-season for Australia you know, between... I don't know, sometime in December, and then right now we're in the middle of the tournament. What does the practice look like? You know, it's a lot about understanding what the individual needs. So with Steve, a lot of times, um, for him to play the way he wants to play, he needs to be really fit mm -hmm. and really explosive. Okay. So, we, we, you know, one of the things is making sure that his off-court workouts uh, – are geared that way so it's not maybe you know it, so he does a lot of power so he does a lot of explosive stuff okay. not stuff that's like heavy and slow but stuff that's like light and fast yeah. so to make those fast switch muscles start and then we can incorporate it on the court and so we want to do a lot of um, a lot of physical drills a lot of drills that re sort of reinforce the footwork patterns that he uses a lot uh -huh. like moving around his backhand like yeah. that, that first step out of the split to move left right. um, stuff like that we like to do a lot of um, do a lot of like sharpening his weapons yeah. trying to make sure that he's confident in that forehand trying to make sure he feels good about his serve you know continuing to work on the slice 
working on hitting two-handed returns. A lot of the, that stuff you know, we'll do in the offseason. At tournaments, it's a little different. Um, a lot of times in tournaments, like we'll work on certain patterns that he's going to use against certain guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more schedule or setting the practice around the opponent, kind of. At tournaments, yeah. If we know who he's going to play, like yeah. we'll, you know, first off, we'll always work on the things that he needs to work on, or the things that he needs to do to feel like he's ready. Okay. So it's going to be a lot of serves, a lot of forehands, some slices. Usually, that's kind of like the steady diet, yeah. um, and then one or two patterns or one or two patterns even in like a fed ball drill that he's going to do like maybe specific sequences he's going to do against you know whoever he plays okay who yeah. does he play Wednesday? he's playing adrian manorino okay so can, can you tell us what's the what's the kind of game plan for that we're not going to release this until after the match <laughs> well steve the, the thing is, people always want to ask about game plans but steve's going to play how steve plays right you know which he's going to slice his backhand he's going to look to hit in big inside out forehands yeah and you know he's going to be really scrappy yeah. um so it's going to be basically like, can he, uh, can he lock Manorino in right. a pattern that, that works for Steve? Right? Manorino is a left-handed yeah, player, so. very good backhand, likes to poke it cross court early. So you know, you obviously you want to stay away from that sort of weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, very crafty, coming off a pretty good Australia. Like he beat Karatsev up there. Okay. I think he beat Murray, maybe. Uh, uh, he did. I think he had a run. So. Like, yeah, he so several rounds. we're gonna just basically you, know, you think we think about trying to put Steve in a position to use those weapons, mm -hmm. so patterns that he's gonna be able to use a slice where he's gonna be able to find inside out forehands. Okay, got it. And so, so against the lefty Manorino, if he's if he likes this this backhand cross court, uh, Steve's running around his, his backhand. Maybe he's going inside out back to the forehand. Yeah, a lot. To, to set up a short ball. Yeah, to set up a ball that he can go inside in on, okay. so that Manorino can't get a clean hit on it. Got it. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then, uh, as far as yourself, um, if you're working with Steve now. Do you uh, have any plans to work with like multiple players or anything like that, or? Uh, is I don't. It's uh, it becomes challenging. I know you're doing this tennis channel thing too. So I do. Yeah, gotta, I, I do some television. On. Like at some different tournaments. Uh, yeah. Like Australia was very busy for me because I did a lot of TV down there. Yeah. Um, you know, US Open gets busy, so it's yeah. tough to really do a good job in everything if you do too many things. Uh -huh. So for me, like I'm pretty content just to yeah. you know work with one player and I work with Steve and then do the television throughout the year and yeah yeah you know, and then focus okay. on everything else and are, are <laughs> you traveling to every tournament with Steve right now that's the plan yeah it is yeah okay. are you doing tennis channel this week as well uh no kind of in between no, 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 they didn't no, ask no. you to do that no <laughs> okay so how, how do you decide uh for tennis channel commentating like well tennis yeah, channel I've only done a couple I've only done a couple things for them oh, uh, really? okay. a lot of times like throughout the year like for Australia yeah. and for the US Open yeah That'll be for the World Feeds production, um, which then goes out to, you know, the ESPN platforms and then goes around to other countries. Um, right. And then Tennis Channel will sometimes pick that stuff up, um, okay. or like World Team Tennis. Uh, yeah. World Team Tennis, they do their own production as well, and then Tennis Channel picks it up. Okay. Um, so it's not actually for, but usually, in most cases, the tennis comes first, the coaching comes first, and yeah. then if I can fill in the TV throughout, like, you know, after that, then that's when I can do that. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still learning about all the <laughs> yes, yes. different things it's everybody's confusing. doing and stuff like yeah. that. Um, so how is the groin for Steve now? Is he, I noticed he's not in the doubles role this week. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's good. I mean, as far as, as, far as I know, yeah. <laughs> it seems good. Okay. Uh, yeah, no doubles. You know, he doesn't play doubles every tournament. Right. And especially this part of the year, too, we want to focus on, like, focus on the singles. Like, he needs to get his ranking back up. Yeah. Um, so we're going to put all the effort into the singles right now. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, a couple of uh, rapid-fire questions yeah. that I like to end with. Ooh, I'm ready. Um, what is your favorite tournament? Paris. Paris. Uh, and Charleston for the women. Okay, why? Because uh, Bob Moran and Eleanor uh, Adams are the best. Yeah. Why Paris? I have great memories. Like Shelby did great there. That was one like one of my the first tournaments I was with the player who you know made it deep. You know she quarterfinal there in 2016. Okay. Um, it, it was a really special. Just you know she was the last person in the main draw. She was 108 in the world. Yeah. She got so in. You mean Roland Garros? Roland Garros. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, first you said Paris. I was thinking the Masters 1000. Sorry, there. Roland Garros. Yeah, yeah. And then, I think that's just a men's event. So, okay. Yeah, Roland Sorry, Garros. Roland Garros. Uh, what is your favorite tennis book? Book? Yeah, tennis book. Um, a Fighter's Mind by Sam Sheridan. Oh, I haven't It's not heard about it. tennis. Huh. It's about uh, combat sports, one-on-one -on -one 
So he goes, I think it's like 10 or 11 chapters. Yeah. Each chapter he goes and spends like a week with a different fighter. Uh -huh. And he talks about how they process competition through their mind. And it's the closest thing I've ever read to what goes on in a tennis player's mind when, when they compete. And like, you know, people love like Brad Gilbert's book, which I do too, and yeah. um, Timothy Galway's book. Yeah, Inner Game. Inner Game. And those are great, but like this, this for me felt like what I felt as a player, or what I want my players to feel like when they're out there competing, which is basically, you know, not doing any judgment yeah. and realizing that there's a result that's inevitable. Yeah. And like, you're going to win or you're going to lose. There's only two things that might happen, and you yeah. need to be okay with both. And, you know, it's going to happen no matter what, no matter like what you think or what you feel right now. One of those two is going to happen in yeah. two hours. So, so what are you going to do to make sure it's? Well, it, well, it doesn't matter. Like, but, but you need to put yourself in the mindset where you can't be you can't be scared of losing. Mm. You can't be afraid to win, okay. because it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. So you, you sort of coming to that like okayness factor. Yeah. I think is a big step forward for a lot of players. I'll have to read it. Yeah, yeah. I've not heard that uh, that one recommended yet. So that book I'll leads to my other favorite book, which okay. is called The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Yeah, I've he read was. That. Yeah. You, you read the Art of Learning? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's I love good. it. He's freaking brilliant. Yeah, he is really good. He makes um, this analogy. Sorry, he makes this analogy uh, about the kids he was teaching in chess or whatever. Where he makes this analogy where they're so they're upset about the errors they made, and they you know they make another error because of that. He makes the analogy of you know when you're crossing the street and a bus goes by that almost hits you and you turn to yell at the bus and you don't see the other car coming and it freaking hits you. <laughs> Which it happens in tennis. Yeah, you know? it absolutely does. <laughs> so anyway, continue yeah. please. No, that wasn't a very book. rapid fire of me. No, 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 you're good. The, the answers don't have to be uh, rapid fire. <laughs> okay. um, the next question was, what's your favorite non-tennis book? But I think you answered that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, next is, uh, did you play a lot of doubles? I guess you played in, yeah, in college. college. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite play in doubles? So, for example, mine is uh, when my partner's returning and they hit a good low return to the opponent who's serving and balling, and then I can poach right off the return mm, and yeah. the point that way. What's, um, what's your favorite play? I mean, my favorite play is running around a second serve return on the, on the ad side and hitting inside out forehand. Inside so, out? Yeah. Okay. Because I played the I played the ad side. Yeah. Um, I thought I returned pretty well from the ad side. Like I loved running around a second serve and cranking a forehand. Yeah. Um, and you're you're angling it off the court. At the guy's feet, it doesn't come back. Yeah. At the feet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. You know, at the time, guys were serving and balling. Yeah, yeah. Now, to be honest, I don't know if you do that return now, because yeah. if guys are staying back, I think it's a different. You know, it's a totally different dynamic now. But um, I love to do that, and I liked um, I liked on a second serve going yeah. on the deuce side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like that yeah. too. Um, deuce side's good too because you have your with my partner serving. Yeah. And forehand in the middle, um, so it makes it a lot easier. But uh, yeah, I tell people that a lot. Like once or twice per set, you should go on a second serve. Hundred percent. Because they. Uh, especially at like our level, like the club level, uh, these returners and, and almost everybody plays traditional formation. But the returners yeah. get in such a rhythm returning cross court, totally. especially on second serve. So you've got to uh, just cut one of those off and get a free point. Absolutely. Um, so last question for you: uh, How do we uh, make doubles more popular at the pro level? Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, Scheduling is one way. I think incentivizing the top singles guys to play doubles because you know yeah. you, you think about the tournaments that do that well, like in Indian Wells, you, you see that like, there's huge crowds when those top players yeah. play doubles. Um, yeah. I think that you know, and I think even in the shorter term, like I think if you can figure out a way to market doubles better, like market the personalities, like tennis, I think does a pretty bad job of you know I think of making people aware like your yeah, average sports fan aware of what's going on yeah, yeah telling the stories I wonder if you think about the you know I'm sure you've seen the NASCAR documentary not the NASCAR too, yeah, the Formula One show on yeah, Netflix to do one for tennis which now. they're doing on tennis but yeah. um, you know I don't even like 
motor racing, but I like right. learning about people. Yeah. And and now I'm like into it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, same thing. Like I was watching the Tom Brady show last night. Like the man in the arena. I don't really like Tom Brady, yeah. but watching him for 30 minutes, like just talk about what he's feeling and thinking. Yeah. Like make oh man, I'm pretty interested in this guy. You know? Yeah, you have to be. So tennis, I think, is the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, when I asked Eric Buterak uh, that question. I think he, he was the one who talked a lot about uh, stories. He was yeah. like, we need to have stories around the players and like get to know the players better because um, everybody knows you know Nadal's personality and yeah. knows like Medvedev's personality, and but in doubles like they don't. Um, the thing so, about tennis that's so, so hard is like you know a lot of times like at least half the draw, the people here are only going to see once. You know what I mean? So if there yeah. was a way for people to see players more often when they're there like I've always thought like I mean I think tennis is saturated with players I think there should be fewer honestly like I think there should be fewer players Mm. and the format should be round robin for singles and doubles Mm. because how like you know if you're you know you you have a family three kids like whatever the kids love tennis you want to buy tickets to come see Jensen Brooks because you guys saw him play on TV during the open yeah when's Jensen Brooks going to play I, I don't know. Yeah, you have no idea. I don't know. So uh, what are fans supposed to do? Like, oh. and, and then he might lose first round. Yeah, exactly. And they might, yeah, exactly. It's, so it's like, it's interesting. You know, and it's just, you know, kids have school and you have work and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, oh, I want to buy tickets for Friday night. Like, you know, seven o'clock, like, you know, quarterfinal is going to be expensive. Like, right. okay, who are we going to see? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe yeah, some no. qual- maybe a lucky loser comes through because like you know two guys were tired or something. I, I think that's one that. of the biggest things really like that good, yeah. tennis has a problem with. You know, right? Because yeah, in other sports, like if I want to go watch the Mavericks game and like, yeah, you can look at the schedule and know where they're going to be in six LeBron. months. Yeah. Like oh, the <laughs> yeah. Lakers are coming to town in March. Like yeah, I'll just buy a ticket now. That's, yeah, that's interesting. That's yeah. a good way to put it. Um, yeah, I, I've not thought about that. So more like round robin tournaments, maybe like eight or that's what I think. Some I mean, pools it, it, with like a semifinal and final, yeah. like the, the ATP final does. Yeah, it's just hard because then it's fewer jobs and you know, like yeah, it's, tough. it's tough. But uh, that's what I think because tennis is so star driven and you know, if you want to have personalities, like yeah, people need to be familiar with who they're seeing. You know, yeah, there's no perfect solution. And you could do all. the same thing for doubles. Yeah, I think. Yeah. But yeah, that's my uh, that's my thing. Awesome. One of my big things. I also think there should be world team tennis after the U.S. Open. Hmm. So and no Asian swing at yeah, that part of the year. It can be a different part of the year. No I China. Do, I do like the uh, the two week format they have with world team tennis. Yeah. Now, though. I mean, COVID kind of forced that, but I think it rejuvenated in one location. I think it's bit. great. Yeah. yeah. Was, the thing is, like, last year. the thing is, like, after the U.S. Open, there's such like there's just like this like crescendo of media attention. Right, uh-huh. like you know, in the U.S. certainly because U.S. Open is a huge story. It's New York, yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, people are like, "Oh, there's still tennis." Like, yeah. Oh, like they're playing in Tokyo in the middle of the night, or yeah. oh, they're playing in freaking Wuhan or Shanghai, like in the middle of the night. Like, why are you know, is this relevant? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so I think that part of the year, like, I think tennis should end around the U.S. Open. And you can have World Team Tennis in the U.S. Like, I bet it'll get media attention because yeah. people are still sort of paying attention after. You know. Yeah, they can carry that momentum. Yeah. yeah. On my like on my website, my traffic, like if you look at a graph of my website traffic, it always peaks at the US Open and then it's just a steep drop right after. So it's exactly what yeah. we're talking about. Um, also Mark, well thanks for coming on. Uh, really appreciate it and uh, yeah, we'll have to do it again sometime. Absolutely man, thanks for having me on. Good luck Wednesday uh, against Man Arena. Thanks dude, appreciate it. If you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches, then join the Tennis Tribe Doubles Strategy Newsletter. Every single Thursday, I'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match. And when you join, you're going to get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will. I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe, and over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays, with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So to sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.